in life, if you don't take risks, you'll never find out. So we took the risk, we took the plunge. And from the idea to actual creation of the business, it was about two months. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on finding success as an entrepreneur, as well as all the work that goes beneath the surface that creates that success. Things like manifestation, following your intuition, getting out of your comfort zone, and living fully and with purpose. Our special guest today that I'm super excited for is Mimi Icon. Mimi Icon is an entrepreneur and influencer who was the founder of luxury hair extension company Luxie Hair, which was acquired in 2018. She's also the co-founder of Intelligent Change, the journal brand behind the popular five-minute journal. Hello, Mimi. Welcome to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. How are you feeling today? Hi, Eileen. I'm, I'm feeling great. Super grateful to be here on your podcast and very, very honored that you have chosen me to be here to share my story. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to have you. I am honored to have you because as I mentioned before recording, I've been watching you for over a decade. You were one of the inspirations of like, like as I was watching YouTubers before I started my YouTube channel, because so long ago you were already talking about self-love and self-growth. And so I do have to thank you for that. I think it was just really great to see an example on YouTube at that time. Thank you so much. I've also have been following your journey for quite some time now. So finally, we're having a conversation. Yes. Amazing. Okay. So there's a lot to cover, but can you tell us your story and how you found success as an online creator? And then we can go into the the entrepreneurship after that. Of course. It's been a long journey. I mean, I first um, started creating creative content many, many years ago. I think it was 2007. And I started with a blog. It was a fashion blog. And I remember even that felt so courageous, like to put yourself out there and like share pictures of yourself and, you know, put all these outfits together. But soon enough, I remember thinking like, I would love to actually experiment with videos, but I didn't have the courage at that point yet. And then fast forward to almost 2010, um, my former husband, Alex Icon and I, we, we were about to get married and I bought clip and hair extensions for our wedding. And I was really disappointed in the quality of these hair extensions. So I remember complaining to him about it and saying like, it was total waste of money. And now I'm not gonna have beautiful long mermaid hair for the wedding. And he just looked at me and he said, what's hair extensions? I've never heard of it. Mm. And um, another story is at the time, we were actually reading um, The 4-Hour Workweek. Have you heard of that book? Yeah. So The 4-Hour Workweek by Timothy Ferris is all about creating um, a business that allows you to have the freedom of time and space and autonomy. And it was truly a dream. And we were kind of looking for that inspiration of what that is going to be for us. And a light bulb moment really um, went off for both of us in that moment, realizing that, you know, there's such a huge opportunity for other women in the world who are looking for good quality, affordable hair extensions and cannot find anything that fits that profile. So we thought, why don't we do it? And it sounded like a really crazy idea at the time because both of us had zero experience in having our own business. Actually, we we had small ventures before that, but it was quite different. And I'll explain what I mean. So I, I dabbled a little bit with fashion styling, which is very different because when you're um, in a service business, you're exchanging time for money. And Alex was doing social media consulting. But again, this is late 2008, 2000, wow. early 2009. So Twitter just came out and nobody really believed in the power of social media yet. And then when we had this idea to create a hair extension company, we just thought everything seems to align and we're going to do it. And we're going to use social media to put it out there into the world. Frankly, because we couldn't afford to have any traditional marketing because we just literally had very little money. We used um, our savings to start this business and also a line of credit. And there was a little bit of credit we had on a visa, which was literally this check that allows you to have, I don't know, I think it was five to 10,000 
interest free for six months. But if you don't pay it in six months, you have to pay 30% back. So it, it was really scary. But in life, if you don't take risks, you'll never find out. So we took the risk, we took the plunge. And from the idea to actual creation of the business, it was about two months. Wow, that's fast. Because the wedding was in two months. So <laughs> oh my gosh. the mission was to find these incredible hair extensions and wear them to the wedding, which I did. And I remember we found the fa first factory that we worked for, with that created these clip and hair extensions on Alibaba. And we worked with 10 different, I mean, we got 10 different samples from 10 different factories. And the first one that I received, I put it in my hair. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I truly feel like a mermaid, like a completely different woman. It felt so transformative. And then I said to myself, don't get excited. There's nine more samples coming maybe this is not the one. And then the other nine were horrible. Like I would never, ever launch any business with the other nine. So I always say there's an element of luck that was involved in the creation of our first business. I, I don't know whether I always entirely believe in luck, but I think there is definitely serendipity. It's like when you're prepared for something and you're ready for it and you see the opportunity, you go for it, and then you maximize the experience. And that's what we did. So we started our first business, which was Luxie Hair in 2010. And we used YouTube for the first five years. The only marketing we did was YouTube. And it was just me and my sister. She was also part of the business. My sister, Layla, she was part of the business for the first two years. And um, the way we marketed the business is just by making hair tutorials. Not I, You probably have seen some of them. I, have seen I don't know them. if you've discovered yeah. me back then. But um, yeah, we would just show women how to style their hair. And then we would just mention that we wear the hair extensions. It was not in any way salesy. It was very organic where I would just mention, hey, by the way, I'm wearing Luxie hair extensions and today I'm going to show you how I'm going to do this braid or Victoria's Secret waves or yeah. curls or straight hair, whatever, right? And yeah, it really took off. And um, yeah, that was my first, um, you know, entrepreneur journey. And um, eight years later, we ended up selling the business with Alex. Yeah, it, it's an incredible success story. And I also Thank have you. to acknowledge, like you were one of the first people to do marketing in that way, to use YouTube tutorials. It, it's like creating content as marketing, but not so not an advertisement like we used to see. So I think that was just genius the way you did it. But I know it's common now, but back then it Absolutely. was so new. Mm -hmm. And at one point you were like the largest hair channel in the world. I'm not sure if it still is, but it was, it, you grew it so big. So did you have your YouTube channel for your own personal like your own YouTube channel or did you only have the hair YouTube channel at that time? So at first we had Luxie Hair and then... That was the first wanted, one that you yes, started? Yes, exactly. That was wow. the first one. And then we opened everything Luxie, which was more like mm -hmm. lifestyle. I vlogs, found you through that. Yeah. Literally vlogs when nobody really did vlogs. Like we mm -hmm. were one of the first to do this kind of content, my sister and I and Alex. And then just like chicha videos, outfit videos, more of lifestyle. Because people, people really crave to know more and they would ask us, what do we eat? How do we work out? Yeah. They wanted to know everything. And I found that really fascinating because I never went on social media to expose my life. I did it to show the product and educate people on how they can use it. And it was fascinating to me because when people resonated with our energy, they wanted to know more. And that grew very organically, um, including then eventually my personal brand, because I, I had my then separate channel, which is under Mimi Icon, which I haven't been posting regularly since I had my daughter, Alexa, because I had to prioritize other things in life. Yeah. And then same with the Instagram page that I, you know, have had for years now, super organic, never intentionally grew it, but it just because... I think when you're aligned with what you're sharing and you're sharing it from a place of abundance, I think people feel it and they want to follow you and they want to know more. Like they know you're not there to take from them. You're there to give. And I think subconsciously people then trust you and share about you. And that's how your page can grow. At least that's how it has always worked for me. All right, my loves, time for a break with our sponsor, Mosh. Life can feel overwhelming. With our busy schedules, it's often a challenge to stay healthy when we want to reach for a tasty snack. Enter Mosh, the brain-boosting protein bar. 
Mosh is the protein bar designed with your brain and body in mind. With six delicious flavors, each Mosh bar includes 12 grams of protein and is made with ingredients that support brain health like ashwagandha, lion's mane, collagen, and omega 3s. At only 160 calories and with just one gram of sugar, Mosh is the guilt free snack your brain and body will thank you for. Plus, these bars were mindfully crafted by top neuroscientists and functional nutritionists, so you know you're getting the best of the best. My personal favorite is the cookie dough crunch flavor. It satisfies my sweet tooth without the guilt. Mosh protein bars will keep your brain and body fit, fueled, and feeling good. Head to moshlife.com slash TLL to save 20% off plus free shipping on your first six count trial pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on your first six count trial pack, which includes all six mouthwatering flavors. M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash TLL. Yeah, I, I think it's it's amazing. I love your approach. I, let's talk a little bit more about your journey as the creator then, because it, it's also been many years and you've evolved over that time. So what is the, the motivation that keeps you going? <laughs> like, is, is this what you love to do the most, the creative part? I think it's such a great question. I, again, I never set out to be a content creator because I look at myself as entrepreneur first. I love creating, I, like seeing ideas turn from an idea to a physical product. I think it's super cool. And then people using it and benefiting from it, whether it's clip and hair extensions and now with our business that we've been focusing on intelligent change, where we have, you know, products like five minute journal, productivity planner, affirmation cards, so many other products now because we've expanded in the last few years. So that is my, has always been my main focus, but then because I realized that when you put out a product, again, people want to know more about you. They resonate with who you are as a human. And then I would come across these people in real life. Obviously, you read their messages and all of that on social media. And I think that's beautiful and special. But it's when I meet people in real life and they come up to me and they tell me, you have changed my life, or they cry, or they share all these stories. I almost have this, not guilt, but there's this push that I actually need to share more because I, I always feel like I share such a small part of my life and yeah. what I do and what I can actually share to help people on their journey because I personally come from nothing. I come from very humble upbringing. I don't think I'm any special than any other human being. I'm a college dropout. Again, I don't think in any way I'm better than anyone else. And if I've been able to create a dream life and go from being super broke and I don't want to say miserable. I was never miserable. I've, I've always been optimistic, but like I was living in a scarcity mindset. So if I, if I was able to do that, I truly believe anybody can. And when I come across these people, I just realize I have a bigger mission than the business and I yeah. need to put myself out there more and serve mm -hmm. people. So I look at my creative content, which I never really monetize. Um, I haven't in so many years. The only ever sponsorship I did was with Audible because I love Audible anyways, and I've always promoted them for free when they offered me money. I was like, great, I'll take it. But right. I literally have never done any sponsored videos ever because I always looked at my social media as a place where I connect with my community and I never wanted to lose their trust. So tell me about the story of creating Intelligent Change and the five minute journal, because I think that's a huge success. And I, I think it's it's something that I always look to for inspiration. I mean, what what is that story and why do you think it became so successful? I think any great business is created as a solution of your own personal problem. When people come to me and they say, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur, like what should be my business or project? I always tell them, look at your own life and any challenge or problem that you have and solve it. Solve it with a product and a service and then put it out there because then you will never have to market this business. It's going to be so authentic and genuine. You're just going to share your story and people are going to buy. People who will need it will buy from you. So going back to your question, what was that story with Intelligent Change and 5-Minute Journal is that, um, as I told you, when we started Luxie Hair, 
I come from super humble beginnings. So we, both Alex and I, we didn't grow up with money. And I think when you don't grow up with money, you are sold this idea that when you get money, like all your problems will be solved and you will be happy and life will be perfect. But the reality is not like that. So in our first year at Luxie Hair, we actually made our first million. Our goal was not to make our first million. We wanted to make 3,000 each so that we can travel to Thailand, have the freedom, mm-hmm. like live the nomadic lifestyle. So for us to make a million dollars was like flying to the moon. So I, I quickly could have anything on my vision board, but because I could have any of it, it it's almost like it's lost its meaning because right. I, then I, I, I realized that, okay, well, all of these things I had on my vision board and I literally created this vision board and a year later I could buy that bag or shoes or fly on in business class. You know, I could do all all these things and go to all these places. But then I remember intensely thinking, but why? Why do I need all these things? Are they actually going to make me happy? So basically I had an existential crisis at about 24, because that's when we started the business, 24 to 25 uh, was that first year. And I became extremely anxious and depressed and in fact, my creative work, like making the YouTube videos was the, the place where I would go to be happy because I felt it was like an escape for me. But then the success made me really question my reality. What am I here to, for? What Am I just here to sell products? Like, what's the purpose of my life? And as much as I always loved Luxie hair and I saw the purpose, I saw how it made women happy, like women who never could grow their hair or who had really thin hair or who, like myself, were getting married or were going somewhere special, wanted that accessory. You know, I saw the purpose with Luxie hair, but I just felt like there was more. And as I was going through this dark period of my life, I discovered a meditation. Um, It really helped me heal a lot of childhood trauma and like trauma that was stored in my body. So meditation was huge. And then also I discovered gratitude. So Alex has introduced me to um, Tony Robbins, who was very um, inspiring figure on his journey. So I consumed a lot of work of Tony Robbins. And I don't know, are you familiar with his work? Mm -hmm. Yes. Wonderful. So Tony talks about this thing called um, the hour of power, I believe. And every morning you go on this gratitude walk and it's about an hour. I mean, it can be shorter, but you go out and you verbally express what you're grateful for. And you can say things that you do have in your life, like your body, you can see, you can hear your partner next to you, or you could say things that you don't yet have, but you want to manifest. And that truly was the most magical part of that practice because we would literally say uh, that we are And this is at the time when we were just starting the business. Like it was in the inception idea. We would say things like, hey, we're making millions of dollars and we're hanging out with Richard Branson and these are our friends and like, this is our lifestyle. We're flying, we're taking boats, you know, like, you know, the dream basically, traveling the world. And within a year we were there. I mean, I remember Alex had this crazy opportunity to go to Necker Island not as a guest, he was working, he was helping a friend to film videos for Necker Cup, but he met Richard Branson literally wow. within that first year. So wow. the power of manifestation, I mean, people have um, different relationship with that word when they hear it because they think it's all woo-woo. Of course, mm-hmm. it's your choice how you take this information. It doesn't mean that you just put it out there, you do nothing, you still have to do the work. But I think having a vision is so important in order to create the reality of your dream. It's like a compass, right? Like you have to have your North Star. If you don't know where you're going, how are you ever going to get there? So yeah, that was really, really incredible. There were so many lessons on that journey. And then we realized that, you know, that practice became an important part of what got us to where we were. But then also it was not very sustainable to go out for an hour walk every day. So Mm -hmm. then we kind of shortened that practice and we added some other learnings that we discovered from different books, um, like Happiness Adventure Advantage by Sean Aker. And, you know, it talks about more of the science of why gratitude works. And many people who will read that book, they will read the book and say, wonderful, I should practice gratitude and then close the book and move on to the next book. But 
there was no workbook to actually practice these things. And in fact, many self-help, or I like to call it them self-growth book, books out there, they maybe will share very valuable information, but oftentimes there aren't enough tools out there. So we set out on this mission to create tools that take these big concepts and break them into simple, beautiful, sustainable products that you can use every day in five minutes a day. And um, when we first printed our first thousand copies of Five Minute Journal, it was just a side project. It was never meant to be anything because we had Luxie hair and that was doing great, growing, growing. And we thought, hey, well, you know, if this doesn't do well, we'll just give them to our friends for the rest of our lives. <laughs> yeah. And funny enough, we had a business partner, UJ, at the time who eventually we ended up um, parting ways. So now it's just Alex and I who are the co-founders. And um, But at that time, when he was part of the business, he there was an event in Toronto and Tim Ferriss, who, as you know, was our original inspiration with Luxie Hair, he was in Toronto and we gifted him the journal. And at the time, he was going through a very dark period in his life. And we said, listen, you've been such a big inspiration and you are actually in the dedication in the five minute journal. Wow. So we hope you love this journal. And he absolutely did. Mm -hmm. He's been using it for 13 years. I think he recently mentioned it again in one of his videos. Aww. He's mentioned it so many times on his podcast. He's mentioned it in his book, Tools of Titans. Yeah. And obviously that really helped to expose five minute journal to mm. a whole different demographic. And yeah. of course, with my social media presence, um, it exposed it to my audience and the product and the brand grew um, incrementally. And yeah, like we've been doing now for, you know, 10 years, but really we've only been focusing on intelligent change ever since we sold Luxie Hair. So only the last few years. Yeah. I'm curious, what is your role in, in like the business? Because I know you partner with Alex. So how do the two of you split things up? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Alex is definitely more... Um, operations, although he's extremely creative and he's got an incredible vision. He understands operations way more than I do. I really do not go into that world because for me, that's not my strength. And I believe in life. If we want to see progress, we should focus on our strength and outsource anything that we can outsource, not to waste time. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, my strength is vision and product creation. Like I'm hyper aware of like global trends, I always have been. And I'm also hyper aware of what I want. And I always think if I want something and I want it badly, there's at least a million people like me in this world. I mean, we're like, what now? More than 8 billion people. So what's 1 million? That's like tiny little percent. So then I set out to create that that I want. For example, the affirmation cards that we have now, there's different categories. There's mm -hmm. self-love, mindfulness affirmations, there's affirmation for kids. Those were all products that were created, you know, with my vision in mind. And um, those are all my favorite affirmations that I've been using mm -hmm. for years. So it's been truly incredible to share the tools that I've been using on my personal journey of healing and self-growth and be able again to put my absolute favorites. Because obviously when you go through a, a journey of self-growth, you go through so many different books and techniques and some stick and some don't. And for me, for example, gratitude and affirmations. It's yeah, game changer. Game changer. It's profound. Mm -hmm. It's so powerful. And it's always funny to me how like people would still challenge these concepts, especially affirmations, because people say, oh, that doesn't work. And it's like, well, actually, anything you tell yourself, you're affirming to yourself, mm -hmm. whether you realize it or not. Like you could say, oh, why am I so stupid? Why does this always happen to me? Why I never attract people? Or you can change that story and say all these positive things. It takes the same amount of energy to tell a story. Why would you say a negative story? So that's all affirmations are. And I think what we do at Intelligent Change, we just allow to share examples of affirmations that helped us to get to the success that we are experiencing. Of course, people can create their own that are more authentic to them. But I think most people don't even know where to start, especially if you're in a dark place. You're just used to that negative inner dialogue that is toxic and is not getting you out of that vicious cycle because the inner dialogue is 
is that conditioning that a lot of us receive from the age of zero to seven. And it's oftentimes how our parents or caregivers or teachers or whoever was around us, how they were talking to us and the belief system, their belief system, their values, their judgments, it's all out there in the subconscious mind. And we're not aware, oftentimes not even aware it's there. And yet it controls 95% or even more of all our decision-making. That's how powerful it is. And how we can retrain that, again, with tools like 5-Minute Journal or just using gratitude. Again, you don't need the journal. You can just use any blank notebook and use that practice in a blank notebook. Or you could get the affirmations from Intelligent Change, or you can just look up some affirmations uh, on Pinterest or create your own, right? Ultimately, it's about creating better habits that are better for your mental and emotional yeah. health. What is your vision and goal for the future of intelligent change? I, f- I feel like there's so much potential. Tell us about yeah. that. Well, you want to hear our big audacious goal? Is yeah. That to, <laughs> yeah, it's to, ch- to change 1% of the global po- population and help them change their life for the better. And if you think about it, 1% is not a lot of people, but also, also it's like more yeah. than 100 people million people. And why 1%? Because there have been so many studies done. This one was done in the 70s in, I think, somewhere in New York or the Bronx or somewhere else. At the time, there was a lot of violence and there was, you know, just like a lot of aggression in the community. And what they did is they they did the study where they got 1% of the population of that neighborhood to practice, I believe it was TM meditation, so transcendental meditation. Mm -hmm. And then they measured how that had an impact on the overall community. And I don't remember the exact numbers, but the violence went down like something like 30, 40%, just because this 1% of the population was practicing mindful meditation. And to me, this is just a proof that as long as we're doing the inner work, we don't need to go out there and change the world. Oftentimes it's it's a distraction. And right now, especially with what's happening in the world, it's very chaotic at the moment. Yep. I don't know what's happening with the stars, the Saturn return or what's going there's on. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot happening yeah. out there because we can all feel it. But a lot of time people are wasting their energy projecting out and blaming, accusing, mm-hmm judging when in fact, if all of us go inside and create a more peaceful inside, that is going to have a much better effect on raising our vibrations globally and creating a more peaceful world. So that is what I'm focusing on personally. And that's what we, you know, encourage with, with intelligent change. So what is the bigger vision? We, we believe in building a community, which we already have been doing for the last 10 years. But now we want to do it in a way where we'll, we'll also have, you know, we, we're already doing events. Um, our first event was last year. We did an intelligent su- change summit in um, Ibiza at Six Senses. So we did a whole buyout. And it was a more of an like exclusive event because it was our first one. But our bigger vision is to do bigger events that are more inclusive and are in bigger cities so more people can attend and also doing small workshops and having retail spaces with experiences so we can actually connect people physically in the real world. Because I think a lot of us are spending so much time in front of the computers. And I think it's great because you know, you and I are able to do what we do because of the screens, because of the social media. And there's so much benefit in that. But at the end of the day, when you meet people in person, when you build that real human connection, nothing compares. And it's merging the two of those. I think that's what we want to do and continue, of course, creating simple tools that can help people on their journey of self-actualization. Because in a nutshell, that's what we do is we just help people self-actualize so they can define their values, their vision, and and focus all their energy on that and live life more intentionally. Yeah, I think that's a beautiful vision. And just talking about how like shifting 1% can shift so much more, that's so true. And it inspires me uh, more to like, like keep talking about things like meditation, keep sharing resources, because it is true. Like we need it. <laughs> it's very, very important. I think we need all the help we can get to help people raise their vibration. And also, like you said, find peace within. Because 
we, in this current state of the world, it can feel like we are out, we have no control over the chaos and there's nothing we can do. And people are just arguing online so much, but it's, you reminded us, you have to work on yourself, go within and find peace within. And if enough of us do that, then the world will be more peaceful. Yeah, because you, if you're peaceful inside, you will not start a war. You will not fight anyone because you won't have it in you to do that. You will do your best to find a solution. You will do your best to look at any situation from a point of view of love and kindness and compassion. And that creates a whole different experience. As long as it's us against them, you know, there will be separation and the ego Mm -hmm. will just replay the same story over and over again. And I believe that we all have a conscious choice to choose the, to A, create a vision of the world we want to live in and then consciously be the change that we want to see in the world. As cliche as it sounds, that is truly the, I think the key to everything is focusing all of our energy and effort on being that change. And oftentimes people don't want to take the responsibility. And one of my favorite quotes by Marion Williamson is like, our deepest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness that scares us the most. We are all so powerful and we all have that light inside of us that can illuminate the way and create positive change But most of us are playing small. Quite frankly, I don't think I'm playing at my full potential yet. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely slowly getting there one step at a time. But if I am completely honest, the vision that I see for myself and where I am now, I'm not there yet. I'm very far away. Um, I'm grateful for everything I've been able to experience and do and create. But the vision is huge. And I think if most of us are honest with ourselves, where most of us are probably playing it small. And I think it's that radical honesty that can take us on that journey of one step at a time, getting again to that self-actualization. The reason I'm doing the shape of a pyramid, because our logo has it as well, is like that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's like the more actualized you are, like once your basic needs are met, you realize you're here to serve. And if you ask most people who have attained financial wealth and they're honest with themselves and realize that no matter how many boats and planes you have, that's really not what happiness is all about. Like you can just get in that vicious cycle of more, more, more things, more. I have no problem with things, by the way. Like we're here living in a material world. We can enjoy them, but it's about not attaching your self-worth and self-value to the material possession and real possessions and realizing that at the end of the day, if we're honest with ourselves, we're the happiest when we are of service. We're the happiest when we feel alive. We're the happiest when we feel like we're here for a reason, when we have some purpose and reason to wake up to in the morning. So that is part of the journey of that self-actualization is realizing what are you here to serve? Like what, what is your purpose? And once you can step in that authentic vision of yourself and you doing it, no matter how hard, quote unquote, or challenging that situation is, you're going to feel alive. You're going to feel happy. You're going to feel joyful because you are aligned with your purpose. And when you don't feel that way, you have to reassess. Because oftentimes your body will tell you when you're not aligned, whether it is the wrong relationship, whether it is the wrong job, the wrong city, anything that is not aligned usually will not feel right. And when you're aligned, it feels right. It's simple as that. Yeah, I love that. I do want to like dig deeper into like your mindsets and because I feel like you have such a great foundation that set you up for success. You talk about, I mean, you already have these successful business stories and you make it sound easy when you talk about it in a quick little, you know, in a podcast, but I'm sure there were a lot of challenges, a lot of things that you had to break through, whether it was a challenge mentally or, or anything. Can you talk about, I don't know how you got through those moments? What were the things that you had to grow through? I think when it comes, if we're speaking specifically 
about business, but I think this applies to any area of life. Yeah, any area. I think one of the greatest books to read on this topic is Big Leap um, by Gay Hendricks. I didn't read the book first. I made the big leap. And then when I read the book, I was like, ah, it makes sense. The concept is so true. And I've read the book so many times because oftentimes what we do is we self-sabotage right before we make the big leap. Mm -hmm. Whether it is, in my case, coming from an upbringing where there was no financial abundance, like we were always very aware of money and it was always tight. And although there was always food on the table, like we were not poor or anything, but, you know, money was always tight. Like you couldn't just go and buy anything you wanted. We didn't travel. I mean, my first trip ever was flying to Canada because my family immigrated there. So I always tell my daughter how lucky she is because I didn't get on on an airplane until I was 16. And that was to immigrate to a different country. It wasn't a holiday, right? So I come from a very different mindset. And in order to be where I am today, like mentally, I had to make that big leap. And how did I make that big leap? Partly is still mystery to me because I remember since I was a child, I was a dreamer. I've always known that A, I'm not gonna stay in Azerbaijan. That's where I'm from originally. I spent the first 16 years of my life there. I just always had this vision of myself traveling the world, living abroad. Um, I didn't know about business, but I just knew that I would be on camera. Somehow I just, I thought I'm going to be an actress, but that didn't happen. But then I realized, but I am on camera. So in a way it came true. Like I'm still Mm -hmm. out there sharing something, not in movies or film, but it, it is in a way film, right? Like it's in video format. So somehow there was that inner knowing that knew, and I followed that intuition. Now here I think is the key. If we all connect to that inner knowing, which I call intuition, like it's actually in your gut, um, I feel like we all know why we're here. And I feel like we all know what our calling is. But I think as children, because sometimes our upbringing doesn't encourage for us to connect with our inner child or that inner knowing, We get conditioned that, you know, follow everybody else, go to school or like follow this certain path that everybody's following. I think there's less of that conversation now, but I think like when I was younger, it was like finish high school, go to university, get married, have kids that, you know, buy a car, buy a house. And I just remember thinking that doesn't resonate with me. Like, I am not going to follow that path. Like, it doesn't feel right. I want to do things unconventionally. And that resonates with me. And I'm so grateful I followed my intuition. I think it's because I followed my intuition that I am here today. And my intuition did tell me that you need to believe in yourself. And I think if we don't believe in ourselves, we'll never achieve any dreams. I think most people, it's not that they're not bright or it's not that they don't have it to make it in business, relationships, whatever area. It's just they don't believe. And again, it's that conscious mental leap that you have to do to say that I'm going to get there. I know I'm going to get there. And again, what do you use? You you use affirmations. You Mm -hmm. create a vision board. Like I literally, a year before we created Luxie Hair, I I was, um, maybe it was a year and a half, two years before we created Luxie Hair. I was doing an image consulting course. And part of that course was to create a vision board. Mm -hmm. And we had to like cut out pictures from magazines. And I remember putting all these pictures of things, experiences, items. And like I told you, when we created Luxie Hair, within the first year, I could have like 90% of those things. And of course, the vision board alone didn't do the work, but it allowed me to have the vision that then allowed my brain to laser focus on what I need to do to get to that vision. And most people are too scared to even create the vision. They don't even know what they want. So again, how are you going to get there if you don't know what you want? And many people listening now might say, well, I still don't know what I want. So how do I get there? Well, make a list of things you want to try. Make a list of things that maybe you have tried that you know spark something inside of you that make you feel alive. Be completely, radically honest with yourself. Not things that they show on social media or things that your parents want you to do or grandparents or your friends or your boyfriend or your husband, 
but things that make you feel alive. Literally sit down and write a list, 10. And then one at a time, start doing them, trying them out. What's the worst that can happen? Like I recently uh, reconnected with a friend who was a very talented videographer and now he's an astrologer, right? So it's like people change their career path because at one point they become aware that even though I'm great at this thing, it doesn't really make me happy. And, you know, you can now make a great living being an astrologer and you can be totally in alignment with what you're doing because you believe that this can benefit people. And I just love these stories where people make this conscious, intelligent change in their life and live more in alignment with what makes them happy. And I think then the world can be a happier place for all. I think we're all ready for that. It's like enough of that old paradigm and story of suffering, self-sacrifice. I don't believe in that. I don't subscribe to that. And I think when you start living from that place, you start manifesting truly the, the life of your dreams. So I don't know if that answers your question. I gave you like a very big answer. No, I love it. I love it. It does. It's a good reminder that we're always guided by our intuition. And sometimes like those big leaps are possible because you stay aligned. And it it sounds like also you have, you're really good at believing in yourself because I think some people need to work on that. And this brings me to the next topic is like, you know, go moving with life shifts. Like I know you made a big announcement yesterday and that's right how like life, like things change, even if you're not planning for it to change, right? Like even career changes. And so, yeah. Do you want to talk about your divorce announcement yesterday, right? With Alex? That was a big thing. Cause I know a lot of people were shocked on the Yeah. So Alex and I, yeah, you're the first person I'm talking about publicly and it is, uh, it was a separation announcement. So Alex and I have decided um, early in September this year that we are going to grant each other full independence and go on our individual journeys, but to give people whoever don't, don't know who we are. I mean, Alex and I, um, we have met at work at a bank many years ago, uh, probably 18, 19 years ago. And uh, we were first just friends. And I believe most relationships actually start out great relationships that end up being effortless and have that great communication that is so important to have a good relationship, long-term relationship. So we had that. We became friends, then we became romantic uh, with each other. And, you know, we were together for 16 years, which is such a long time because we also always worked together and always spent all of our times together because we were best friends for all these years. And I never in 16 years questioned my relationship. I am the type of person, like, when I know something, I know. Like I just, again, because of my intuition, I guess, it always guides me in life. And this year for the first time, I I questioned and I realized that if I'm questioning, there's a reason why this is happening, right? Like, because it's it's not normal to me. I like, I've done this for long enough to know that this is not a normal experience. And then being radically honest, A, first with myself, and then being honest with Alex and having very maybe difficult conversations not maybe difficult conversations, right? But necessary conversations. And some of the lessons, I guess, that came out of this experience of like processing all of this for the last eight months, because this is something that, you know, started in March and slowly, slowly, like as we tried to work and see if we can make it work or separate, um, we talked for hours and hours and hours. And it was so beautiful because we never had to go to a therapist. (laughs) We just, we did the therapy and therapy Mm -hmm. is really giving each other space to talk and respect the other person and actually listen, not listen with your mind, but listen with your heart and listen with your intuition as well, because then you can connect and be like, hey, this person is just going through something. It is not personal because most people would take things personally, get upset. But in our case, because we have been doing the inner work for so many years, and again, we've always prioritize our communication and our relationship. There was never any drama. It's just like, it was, and I mean, maybe people listening will be like, this is impossible. (laughs) Literally, we've had arguments over silly things like, 
you know, when Alexa was born, Alex wanted her to go to nursery at one. And I was like, no, I want to, I want her to stay home till she's two because I can afford to stay home with her. And I remember we had some really heated arguments about that. But when it came to our relationship and like deciding on the separation, nothing heated. Pure love and respect of each other's journeys. And that was the most beautiful thing to experience, still is. Like even last night we announced it and then we talked until like one in the morning about it. And there's a lot to unpack in a relationship, but ultimately it's that idea that we don't possess each other. We never had this belief that I possess him or he possesses me. We were never halves. We were two wholes that came together. Now, what happens in a relationship oftentimes, and I thought it wouldn't happen to me because I feel like I was hyper aware of it, but it's like you over time do become slightly or severely enmeshed and codependent. In our case, I would say it was very, very slight, but still it happens. And at some point, I think there comes a time where you want to almost like rediscover yourself and be like, who am I? Not as a wife or as a mom, but like, who am I as a person? Mm -hmm. Like, what am I made out of? And yeah, I think maybe all of us go through this journey and maybe most of us suppress that. I don't know. But in my case, I I feel like because we were honest and we honor each other's freedom and independence, we just came to the conclusion that at this time we have to, we have to respect each other in our individual journey and let each other go. Mm. And the most beautiful thing is that we still have that incredible friendship. And I believe we will continue being friends and obviously co-parents because we have our incredible child, Alexa Love. You know, the reason her second name is Love is because, you know, she's the product of love, most beautiful, magical, romantic love. And I think, Mm -hmm. you know, I was reading the comments yesterday and, you know, most were so loving and positive, but some people are like, but now I will never believe in love. And to me, that's almost absurd. Just because a journey has gone into two separate ways doesn't mean that what people had was not a love story. I think people have these unrealistic expectations that a love story has to last a whole lifetime. But you know what? People now leave more than they ever have. Like back in the olden days, you know, we were lucky to get to 30, 40. Now some of us leave to 100 or more. It is unrealistic to expect that people need to stay monogamous in the same relationship for their whole life. Some people do, and that's wonderful. I think it's incredible, but that's truly the minority. And not just to stay together, but to stay happily together. Yes. Because, mm-hmm. you know, the truth is, and I've obviously been doing this research now because I've been going through this experience, is that 65% of all relationships end up in divorce. The other 20% stay together because they cannot afford to live apart and they have children. And then what are we left with? Like 15, 20% of people who are together. And how many of these are actually happily together or they're together because it is comfortable to stay together, right? right? Because they are now codependent. Yeah. Like, let's be real. Mm-hmm. And I think if we distill it to like, who is really, truly like still romantically in love and choose to be together, the percentage is going to be tiny, absolutely tiny. And I think I, I just don't want to be that. Like, I, I believe, I, I believe in love. I believe in romance. I believe that you can be in a relationship and be like, hell yeah, I'm choosing this because that was my experience for 16 years, right? So I still believe in love. And for anyone listening, I think it's important to just commit to your own inner work, to be self-secure as a person. And sometimes maybe you'll need to be single for a period of time. And then you don't know where that journey will, will take you. But I think the most important thing is not to betray yourself. Because if you want to be truly alive, and again, that's my personal mission, it's important to me to feel like I'm alive, like I want to be here, like I'm choosing this reality. I'm not a victim. Like I, that, it doesn't feel right to be a victim. It doesn't feel right to self-sacrifice, right? Then sometimes you have to make these difficult decisions to choose yourself in a situation and That is truly empowering and vulnerable at the same time, but vulnerability and stepping into your courage can have a profound effect on all your relationships. And I think another beautiful thing that we have realized is that you can do it in in a respectful way where 
everybody's fine. You know, I got so many messages last night from people like, are you okay? I'm like, we're all good. Like we're genuinely good. Of course, it's not easy because both of us were severely attached to each other, 16 years of life. Right. But also we are excited for each other and we know we will be there for each other on this new journey as well, supporting each other through the process. And again, nobody knows what happens long term because if you told me I'll be in this situation a year ago, I would literally laugh at you. I would be like, <laughs> that's really funny. No freaking way. But here I am. Yeah. It really feels like I'm in a dream, but it's a reality. And you know what? It feels like the right decision. And that's why we have made it. So again, connecting to that intuition and feeling, it's so important because it didn't feel right to stay and be there just because I'm expected to stay and be there or I need to self-sacrifice because now we have a child. Like many, most people I think stay because of the kids. And I want to mention this point because for anybody listening, like this is, I think the old programming, like our, a lot of our parents come from that programming where like they stayed as a self-sacrifice where, you know, I always told my parents, I wish you guys separated because you were fighting all the time. And I'm sorry if my parents are listening to this and it maybe it, it hurts their feelings, but it was very toxic. You know, it was very, very toxic. And I remember growing up, I wish that they would separate and we would just be in peace with one of them at a time rather than in this toxic environment. Now, we didn't have this toxic environment. We just like peacefully decided to separate because if you don't, I feel like then you start building resentment mm -hmm. and that's how you, you then you have a toxic environment. And I think that negatively affects the child way more than happy parents separating and like spending quality time separately or together co-parenting, right? And another thing is that self-sacrifice, especially for women, because we've been like conditioned to self-sacrifice as women for generations and generations, is that, again, you end up then building resentment towards your child. Mm -hmm. And what is that going to create long-term? That's not healthy it, at all. Yep. Is that going to create a healthy relationship? And then, you know, you might get depressed and then you're going to start to you know, to take medication. And again, it's like, then you are, again, not living your authentic truth. What are you modeling to your child? And I want to model to my child that always listen to your intuition, like live your authentic self. You can make it in life, whether you're with a man or on your own and believe in yourself and trust yourself. And ultimately there is no right or wrong way to live life. There's your unique way to live life and you have to honor that. So I'm not saying I'm the right person to advise people on relationships, but I know what feels right for me. And that is my message here. And that is what I would love to inspire for my child. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Because I, I totally agree with you. Everything makes so much sense. I think it takes so much courage. Like you were so brave to put yourself first and have the difficult conversations, do the difficult thing, knowing that it's the right thing, right? A lot of people avoid that or they put that off for many, many years because they're trying, you know, the old programming is there. But ultimately it's, I, I am also like happy to hear that you did it very, so mature and so like both people were healed. Like there was no like toxicity between each other. It's just, it's, it's hard still, but it's truly loving and understanding and respecting each other. Like, and it is true. We are, we do live long. I think about this all the time. So I've been with my boyfriend 15 years. We're oh, wow. not married. We're not married yet, but I think about these things already. Cause like everyone in our lives, they'd get married, have kids. But like, I also have that mindset. I, I can't, promise forever because anything can change. I could change in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and nothing is promised. So that's, I always had that, like that thought in my head. So it's, I don't know. I, I like, it's nice to hear it from you. And it's also nice to hear, like, it doesn't mean you're not in love. It doesn't mean don't get married ever. It just Absolutely. means that you have to be okay. You have to accept that anything could change. And ultimately you have to do what's best for yourself. And that you're going to be okay. Yes. That's scary. A lot of people don't know that. They don't believe That's that. That's the thing. I think mm -hmm. we overhype romantic relationships, right? I think they're incredible, 100%. I've been in the most amazing, magical, romantic relationship for the last 16 years. But I also, I'm fine on my own. And that is so empowering. Because when you are in a relationship for so long, literally you start thinking that you cannot make it without this person. Mm -hmm. And now... 
you know, starting to spend time apart, I'm like, I love my own company. I love spending time with my girlfriends because we spend a lot of time together, like a lot. Um, so I love doing all these things on my own. I love traveling and like all these things that I've forgotten because I didn't even have a chance to do them for so many years. So it is truly empowering to realize that again, it's wonderful. And I still believe in relationships. I would like to again, be in a relationship at one point, but not out of a desperate need, but out of a conscious choice that I want to be here. And I'm personally on a journey of making sure that I am securely attached because I think um, that's part of the work that I've been doing in the last few months as I'm going through this experience is that I've been learning a lot about attachment theory. I don't know if you know yeah. much about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could be ideally securely attached, but that's very few of us. Um, and then you could be dismissive avoidant, fearful avoidant, uh, anxious, preoccupied. Like these are some of the attachment styles that come um, that are formed based on our upbringing and whether we were neglected or given love or a little bit of both. And it's just been fascinating where I do realize I am mostly securely attached, but I have tendencies of being avoidant or being anxious. And it's been fascinating because when I was in a relationship, I didn't see it. Like I, it was just a complete blind spot. Mm. And now that I'm outside of it, I'm like, Oh boy, <laughs> I realized there's all this work that I still need to do because now that I'm on my own, I've like almost raised my standards of who I want to be in a relationship. Like I want to be even a better partner than I was, than I was before. I, because of my, I guess, slightly anxious attachment style, again, it wasn't like dramatic or anything, but I feel like sometimes I use, let's say Alex for safety because I didn't feel safe. Mm -hmm. And now because I'm on my own, I'm learning to feel safe on my own. I'm like, I never want to be in a relationship. And I did it very subconsciously, by the way. I only realized that after I came out of the relationship or was about to come out. I never want to use, in a way, use quote unquote, again, it's subconscious, but like I want to go into a relationship being fully secure. And I feel like when we go fully secure, there's less chances of us becoming codependent and less chances of us becoming enmeshed. And then you just allow even more freedom. Even though both of us had a lot of freedom, we all, because freedom is our top value for both of us. And both of us were always free to travel and do all these things. I feel like now in a relationship, I would be like, you can travel even more. You can spend even more time with friends because now I'm learning that actually what is healthy is to spend at least 50% of your free time on your own or with your mm. friends or doing activities right. that make you happy. And then the rest, the other 50% with your partner, where like in our situation, because we loved each other so much and we enjoyed each, other, each other's company so much and we were, we, you know, became each other's best friends. I think we spent like 80, 85% with each other. And even when we were hanging out with friends, we were, the two of us were still there. So I think I would do things very differently in a relationship when I'm again in a relationship. So like so many new insights just by going through this experience. And, you know, even though I feel like we had such a great effortless relationship, there's still room for improvement. And I think this is these types of experiences where you might go on a break and you might be on your own. Use this as an opportunity to upgrade yourself. That's personally what I'm doing because that's what excites me. And then you won't even have to, you know, go out and attract things because like you're going to be a magnet. A person who is doing inner work is a person, again, who is attractive, alive. And then people are like, they come to you like bees. Like it's super easy to attract. So focus all your attention of like embodying the best version of yourself and then the right partner will come along. Yeah. Yeah. Truly. I also believe in that as well. So, so now what's next for you? I guess, what are you excited about in your life? What is the new dream life that you're hoping to create? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the word for 2024 is definitely going to be creating a new vision, which I'm yeah. still in the process of like visualizing what that is for me. Um, it's definitely like exploring more and playing more. I realized also in the last few months, as I've been going through this process of realizing that, you know, we're going to separate, that I've been, for most of my life, I've been so responsible and 
I've been the rock to so many people. I've been like the parent to my parents and my, mm. you know, to so many people in my life where I'm like, I'm letting go of all that responsibility. I only have one child. That's good. And I'm just going to let my inner child out. And for me, it's all, it's going to be all about exploration, play, fun, dancing, like doing the things that make my soul sing. And it is because inside of us, there's the inner child and the inner parent. And I have a very strict inner parent that kind of you know, put the inner child in a box and said, sit there. We need to accomplish so many things and we need to be a parent and a good wife and a good sister and a good daughter and, you know, all these things, friend. And the inner child never got a chance to play. And I think when you do that, um, at one point, your inner child starts rebelling. And that is probably, you know, part of my experience. And it's been really beautiful, like slowly, like letting my inner child out. There's so many profound lessons and so much healing that is coming out with that experience. So I'm really excited about like going deeper there and seeing what gifts I can receive because inner child is also all about creativity. So a lot of new ideas for projects, business ideas will come out of that. So in terms of connecting it even to the business, like I want to, like, I love speaking. So I want to speak more. I love people. I want to be more around people, like physically. So I'm, I'm planning like more workshops in London and perhaps even other parts of the world that I will travel to. So I want to do more of the things that make me happy, which is all about community and service for me anyways. And yeah, so that's what I'll be focusing on for the next, you know, six to 12 months. And then... Yeah. Also, yeah, creating that bigger vision of like, again, realigning with my values and making sure that I'm truly embodying them. Because oftentimes most of us are not even aware of what our values are. If you're listening to this and you never consciously sat down to define your values, here's your chance to do it. Pause this and take a piece of paper and a pen and write down 10 values that are most important to you that you want to live your life by. And for me, I can share some of them. Like freedom is my top value. Then is deep and meaningful relationships. I don't do shallow. Like I like to go deep with people. Um, number three, I think is transparency. Then there's gratitude. Then there's kindness. Um, so there's so many more. Like define five to 10. If you don't want to do 10, you can start with five, but then once you put them down, you have to reflect and be honest with yourself. Am I truly living in alignment with my values? And it really helped me actually go through my experience of the last few months as we were making this decision to separate that, you know, I looked at my values and I was like, am I being kind through the process? Am I being fully authentic? And constantly stepping into the values helped to make the decision and helped to make it and do it in the most peaceful way. So it is profound, the change that can happen when you are A, aware of your values and B, you're living in alignment with them. And then the next step, of course, is like sitting down and creating that bigger vision for yourself. So envisioning your life in three to five years, I've done this exercise years ago. And quite frankly, a few years ago, both Alex and I realized that we are in it. We're in the vision and it's beautiful and it's great. And it's like, oh gosh, but like, it is so good. Like, are we too ungrateful to ask for more? Like, so in almost like, we felt a little par paralyzed almost like, but it's so good. Like, what else could we ask for? It is so incredible. I think if you stay in that place for too long, you become too comfortable and then something is going to have to shift eventually. If you're not going to shift it yourself, life is going to make you shift. Because we're not here to be safe and comfortable. We're here on a journey. And again, nothing wrong with being safe and comfortable if it makes you feel happy and you feel aligned. But I'm, again, speaking for my personal journey. I don't feel good feeling safe and comfortable for long periods of time. I need to feel like I'm growing, that I'm learning. It really was, it's what excites me in life. And... As we were discussing all of these things in the last few months, we both realized that, gosh, we have not created that vision. And now is the time to do it because we've been neglecting it because we got it. And we, in a way, maybe got a little too attached to it. Because here's the thing, when you achieve your vision, again, you have to make that mental leap 
in a way to ask for more. And it can be a blind spot for many of us that we are so scared of the unknown, of the bigger vision, that we would rather stay again small in the current vision because it's good because this is all I ever dreamt of, right? But you've achieved it and you're still young and you still have a life to live. Where are you going next? Again, from a place of abundance and gratitude, like I'm grateful for my life, but I know there's more. And gosh, if I've learned anything in the last, you know, eight months of this process is that I have learned so many new things about myself that I didn't know that I was like, I'm 37 and I never knew this about myself. Like never knew that I have a fear of abandonment. Never knew that I'm slightly, you know, anxious in relationships. I just didn't see it. You're not aware of what you're not aware. So yeah, the vision is huge. And if you're not going to create it, life is going to create it for you. So instead of letting life take the charge, I suggest that, you know, you take the charge and you spend that time and you visualize that life that makes you feel alive and excited and, and whatever it is that you want to embody and live and experience, because it's so individual to every single one of us. We all want different things. And what that's what makes life beautiful, the diversity of um, our individual experiences. Yeah, I think it's so crazy because most people are just trying to reach their first vision. But it is true. Once you've reached everything that you ever wanted at one point, you you can't just stay there. You have to take another big leap because if you stay there, you're like it's not good to stay too comfortable and safe. Eventually, it's you're going to be going downhill if you try to keep what you have. So it's always, life just keeps going. There's like more and more challenges, more things to uncover, more to grow. It's It just keeps going. <laughs> just to add to what you're saying, because that vision became the comfort zone. Right. And magic happens outside of the comfort zone. Not to say that it's not beautiful or it's good, but it's you're just not growing anymore. It's like the same thing over and over again. And again, some people are okay with that. And there's nothing wrong with that if you're okay with it. But if you're not okay with it, if you're not feeling right in your gut, be honest with yourself. Be radically honest with yourself. Wow. Because who else will? Nobody else will do this work for you. Only you can do it. Yep. Well, Mimi, we are kind of towards the end of our time. I know you have so much more to share. So I encourage everyone to continue following you. I hope you continue to share more online because you just have so much wisdom and I love listening to you talk. So, so lastly, Mimi, where can we find you online? Of course. Thank you um, for giving me, you know, the stage to share my story again. I really mm -hmm. appreciate you being here today and asking me all these questions and allowing me to channel all this out. Yeah. And people can find me on social media. So on Instagram, it's at Mimi Icon. And I'm not very active on YouTube, but I still have lots of videos out there that you can consume and um, maybe get inspired by. And it's also under Mimi Icon on YouTube. Thank you so much. I love this conversation and I just wish you the best. Thank you, Eileen. I really appreciate that.